All right, it's getting late, uh, later in the day at least, and you might hate me for this, but it's time for your science class. <laughs> <coughs> so we're gonna teach you the ABCs of science today, okay? But first, remember when you were a kid and you were doing science experiments and you had fun with these cool little things you, you discovered with? Um, your parents may not have thought that was fun, but you, you were very curious about what you could learn from these experiments. Well, unfortunately, as we grow up, we kind of lose that ability to be curious, and other things start taking over and start influencing us. You may know that Picasso once said that everybody's born an artist. Well, I like to believe that everybody's born a scientist. I mean, think of it. Ever, from, from early on, you start uh, discovering things. You start doing little experiments to learn about your environment. And even if you come up, grow up to be a scientist, you, you let other things look get in the way of that and let other things take over. And we need to get back to some of this basic scientific curiosity. So I've been a scientific researcher for over a decade and I've seen other things take over um, with a lot of myself and a lot of our colleagues because science is mainly done by people and people are influenced by a variety of things. One of these things is money. It costs a lot of money to do science. On average, it costs about $300,000 per year to run a research lab in the US. That money has to come from somewhere. Money's not free. Depending where the money comes from will determine to some degree what type of science is being done. In academics, most of the money comes from research grants, which are given by a certain organization. The grant is written on a certain topic. In pharmaceutical industry, the research is done to develop a certain drugs for a certain, to cure a certain disease. Have you ever wondered if you might die of cancer? I think after today, we heard a lot about dying of cancer, so most of you have had that thought. Have you ever wondered if you're gonna die of worms or worms infections? Unless you had some bad Chinese food or something, you probably haven't. <laughs> but in 2011, about 13 million people died of worms and infectious diseases on a global scale. In that same period, half of that, seven million people died of cancer. When you look at the research dollars, about $76 million was spent on worm research. And that includes flatworms, roundworms, tapeworms, any worm you can think of. At the same period, $5 billion was spent on cancer research. As you can imagine, these cancer research dollars were spent in an area where people can afford the medication, can afford the treatment that comes out of the research. Don't get me wrong, we need to do cancer research. A lot of people suffer from it, we need to find cures and treatments for that. But my point is that the research follows the money. Another big influencer is fame and glory. We all want that Nobel Prize. In academics, you have to, there's this famous saying to publish or perish. You have to get those next publications out to make, to make that next promotion, to get that next grant. In pharmaceutical industry, if you or your team discovers the next drugs, you're the one getting the promotion, getting the bonus. There's nothing wrong with some competition. It's good to drive research forward. But if it gets to an extreme, there's gonna be a cost. From 1970 to 2012, there's been a tenfold increase in the amount of scientific publications that have been retracted. That was published by the National Academy of Science last year. Now, given that number is still small compared to the overall amount of publications out there, but the fact that there's a tenfold increase is a bit alarming. When it gets to extreme cases, it may lead to some fraud in science. Earlier this year, the New York Times put out an article about um, a former professor in psychology from the Netherlands, Diederik Stapel, who had invented data for 55 of his publications and 10 of his students' dissertations. He just made up the data. So when he was asked, why did you do this? His response was, well, nobody cares about the basic science results. People want to see groundbreaking results that move science forward. And he actually acknowledged that he did it out of a desire for fame and glory. So it's definitely a driver in scientific research. Another big influence is politics. Depending on which political party is in power in Washington will, to some degree, determine what research is done and what not. Think, for example, at the stem cell research debate. Another one is alternative energy. Some political parties put more emphasis on renewable energy than others. By the way, you know how hard it is to draw a donkey in PowerPoint? <laughs> and I challenge you to do this. <laughs> so about four or five years ago, 
Um, I was doing research on um, algae for proteins that we isolated from that. And the Department of Energy decided to put more money into uh, biofuels. And myself and other researchers in my field switched our research towards algae biofuels. Again, it's a great technology, and it's promising for, as a fuel source for the future. But it is because of some political decisions that we have the, the means to do this and the means to do this research. Now, all these influencers are not necessarily bad that I mentioned so far. But if we let those take over, over a basic curiosity, we may end up something like this. And nobody really wants that. So to stimulate that scientific curiosity, we need to go back to childhood years. These are my twins. They're scientists, as you can tell. <laughs> this was taken about uh, three or four years ago in my lab in Arizona. And ever since they've been in kindergarten, I've been going to their classrooms to do a little science experiment for the class. And there's usually about 20 or 25 kids in the room. And I start off by asking, who wants to be a scientist? And a few hands go up. At least two, they better. <laughs> um, and then I do my science experiments. I, I make some dry ice and water that makes some smoke. I make some volcanoes for them, um, changing the color of water to bright pink. And the kids are really engaged, and they, they're curious about what's going on. So at the end of the, um, the class, I ask again, who wants to be a scientist? And I can guarantee you about 20 or 25 hands go up in the air. What really fascinates me that Years later now, I still have some of these parents coming to me and saying, remember those science experiments you did with our kids? My son still wants to be a scientist because of that. And that to me is how you spark the scientific curiosity in kids. And they will have it with them for the rest of their career as they move forward. Now, for the rest of us already doing science, we can't go back to our childhood years. So I propose that we organize the first international conference on apparently useless and undervalued science. Wouldn't that be great to attend that conference? Think of all the things you would learn that you never thought of that people were doing. But I can guarantee that some of these things that you find there will come back in the next couple of years and influence your life. When I was doing my PhD studies um, over 10 years ago, I was studying, as I mentioned, proteins, these photoactive proteins. What that are is proteins that are influenced by light. So if you have a protein and you shine blue light on it, it changes, shine red light, it changes back. It's a really fascinating system. Um, but during those PhD years, I, I went to parties, and scientists go to parties sometimes. <laughs> They're usually not the life of the party, but they do go. Um, and people ask me, so why do you study this? What do you do with that? And to me, it was like, this is cool. Don't you want to know how this works? This is fun. Um, but in reality, I could never give a satisfactory answer. Well, now, 10 years later, um, these type of proteins are at the basis of a new field in science called optogenetics. What that is is, how, is a, a tool that's being used to uh, do gene regulation um, based with light. So you turn genes on, on and off with light using these proteins. And that's an important non-invasive research tool now that could become a treatment tool in the future. We'll see how that works out. My point is that we have this pyramid. At the bottom of this pyramid, at the white base, is basic scientific research. That leads to applied scientific uh, science on the top, and then innovation on the top. So we need this basis to feed into innovation. We need to keep on investing in basic scientific research, which is sparked by curiosity, and which is broader than just the innovation on the top. If we fail to do that, the pyramid's going to crumble down, and innovation will come to a halt. So as you leave today, I want you to feed your inner scientist, and become more cu curious, become more creative, and true innovation will follow. I did tell you I was going to teach you the ABCs of science, so here we go. A, always be curious. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>